Hello! You saw the title, so let's not waste too much time on preambles. We've got a lot to talk about here, and it's going to take a while to get through. There is a minor schism in the online Battletech community that it is slowly growing as internet drama does. The subject matter? Whether or not one should paint their mechs. As for what side of this silliness I'm on, well, if you couldn't tell by the title, I am Pearl Paint and Pearl Paint Accessories. Now I won't go on for a, an hour or so adding context and building up to the actual subject matter here. You came into this video expecting the subject matter, so that's what we'll get to first. All the other stuff will come after. That's just going to have to be good enough. Quick question. Who deters newcomers to a game more? The guy who paints his midis in public? Or the guy who buys all at a local BNN Battletech stock, even though he already has half the items in question. Both exist. Another question. Which would draw more newcomers into a game? Two people playing a game on a coloured map sheet, but using mechs that are covered in more dust than paint? Or the same map sheet, but actually painted mechs? Who looks like they love the hobby more? Last question. Who has to preach and proselytise more? The guy who thinks painted minis look better and reflect a better engagement with the fandom? Or the guy who filibusters every single post to that effect, saying that paint doesn't really mean anything? If you answered B to all the above, you are correct. Painting the mechs is the natural state of not only Battletech, but many tabletop war games. I've sat at my local store painting my com guards and had people come up, see what I'm doing, and ask if that's that Battletech game and marvel at the paint job, mediocre though I consider myself to be. That same guy mentioned wanting to give the game a look, so sadly, I didn't have them on me, but if I had my two starter lancers ready for that purpose then and there, and my battle mats, I'd have given him an alpha strike match just to let him get a feel for the game. Do you really think that someone would just walk into a hobby store, see the toy soldier games arrayed on the walls and shelves, right next to the paint, and not make the connection? I mean, the only mainstream war game I've seen that actually has pre-painted minis is Star Wars. And again, that's the only mainstream one. I'm sure you found one or two, but otherwise, you can expect miniatures to be in need of paint. Sure, not painting the minis isn't a bannable offense, but it's about standards. It takes so little time, and if anything, having to soapbox about not needing to paint sounds like that one neckbeard in every game store who has to adopt a contrarian point of view because his oppositional defiance disorder is flaring up again. Don't be that, chud. That's the personality people expect from TG nerds, that you're the negative stereotype of, not the guy who's more hobby-inclusive to newbies by simply saying, hey, this will look better. Red. Contrary to what some people tend to believe, you don't actually need to be the best painter in the world, or even your local gaming store, to be of accepted or acceptable quality. It's not about being a paint snob, or a paint Nazi, or whatever it else you never dare call Bob Ross to his face that it is. It's about putting paint to plastic and making the mech your own. Two players use unpainted mechs against each other with some chassis overlap, or maybe you both bought a Thunderbolt along. That will be harder pressed to remember which mech belongs to who. And before you say, um, are you an idiot? I'd never forget which one is mine. There are many stories about people forgetting which mechs are theirs, even with completely different chassis. People posting mechs in the box and asking what's in it, as if the box doesn't come with cards answering that very question inside. There are people who can't quite remember which is whose, for whatever reason that is. They could be distracted from the rule book that they have to look up. They could have been talking to someone else for a second. That's just how it is. It takes all types to make a nation. Not everyone's got an eidetic memory. In fact, few people do anyway. There's no painting awards, so you don't need to make it a competition to win. You want to compare yourselves to someone who paints really well as you're just starting out, and you're going to let that discourage you because you're not as good as them? As Jake the Dog from Adventure Time says, Being bad at something is the first step to being sort of okay at it. You go and just let a cartoon dog be wiser than you all? How do you think someone's supposed to get good at stuff? Like, are you, are you going to say that if you lack natural talent, then you're nothing? If you're going to say that, then you've admitted that it is simple, barefaced superiority on our part that causes people to paint in a satisfactory way. 
You would also be painfully wrong. It is time and effort. Time spent painting things, learning one's visual literacy and fine-tuned dexterity to give you the muscle memory and know-how to recreate anything you imagine. Very few people are naturally talented beyond a passable paint job. The rest is nearly always the fruits of time and effort. This is what got people into any skill set. Don't be that guy who acts like a petulant child and storms off from the art room in a huff because someone else paints a better looking painting in the class. Give it a try. In fact, there are people who have posted their kids' paint jobs online to show that they've got kids and are the cool dad. Sure, the kids aren't usually great at painting, but so what? They're enjoying themselves and just trying to have some fun with dad. And they'll be better with practice too. Are you going to tell a kid that this thing they enjoy isn't worth the time because they suck at it now? If so, are you sure it's the paint Nazis chasing newcomers from the game? Well, what do you think playing the game will take? Will the gameplay just fall into your head with a perfect recall the first time you read it? What are you, the Taskmaster? If so, then your eidetic memory will just need to watch one Duncan Rhodes video and BAM! Instant Rembrandt. No time or effort required. Otherwise, it's time and effort to learn the game and to be able to play it in a way that takes less than 10 hours to do a single Lance vs. Lance game. The same frustration of taking forever to learn to do something is still right there, and at least when you learn how to paint, it's done. And each time you play a game, it only makes another loom on the horizon. And the fast games are not that fast either. Games tend to take all day if they're in a tournament. People are willing to work multiple gig economy jobs to be able to spend money to go to those. You can't half finish a game of those days either and just come back to it after everything's been packed up. I mean, you can with kitchen table games, but that adds a lot more of your supposedly limited, precious time and takes effort to recall the positions and state of everything. But the painting is too time consuming? What kind of lifestyle are you leading that you can't spend half an hour to make a little bit of progress on your mechs, but you can play the game that takes literal hours and spend your entire life funding it? Well, I don't even play the game! Get the fuck out of here! No, seriously. You don't paint, you don't play, you just buy? That's not a hobby. That's shopping. You're definitely not as good as us who do. If you don't buy either, then what do you even do? Why are you even here? Sure, there's no gun to your head to paint the mechs at any high standard or even at all, but there's almost zero effort needed to spray them olive drab, dip them in a tub of hobbyist black ink, then slap some silver on the gun barrels and maybe some faceplate and laser glow. It's not like 40k or Flames of War where you have to paint a large number of models, it's just four, at least at the start. It's not like Malifaux, where the details are so fine and shallowly sculpted and intricate that you need a magnifying glass and careful steady hands to paint them well. They're blocky robots with deep armor panels. No other hobby complains as much as the Battletech paintlets do about the idea that people prefer their forces to be painted. None. Imagine getting into a hobby, or a fandom, and balking at the idea of seriously engaging with it in any way other than passive consumption or considering the hobby element of a war game as an odious hurdle to jump on the path towards winning a game with everything decided by rolling two dice at a time. Win at all costs in a game of chance. The pursuit of shirking effort, effort in itself, for something that ostensibly interests you, for your supposed fandom and hobby, it's just outright cringe. It's Tess Holiday saying, F your beauty standards to say obese is equally beautiful as athletic while following the typical beauty standards for hair, makeup, skincare, clothing, poses, etc. You are the lazy and shiftless, demanding to be lauded as deserving equal praise to those who actually strive for a greater result than you are willing to even mimic. No, it's not. Go look up MS Paints. He shows how simple it is to paint well and he has multiple sclerosis, hence the name. There are people on the Facebook groups who paint tiger patterns on their mechs, have them clean and crisp, better than I could do, and they've got Parkinson's, you'd never notice. Painting of minis is a good and widely lauded calming activity for many with neurodivergences and lessened mental capacities. As a former disability support worker, I can personally attest to the effectiveness of art therapy. Also, the number of people with ADHD and or being on the autism spectrum watching this very video and possibly thinking, based, is likely more than you'll think. To look at 40k again, that oft-compared opponent, the Green Knight, 
Beautiful sculpt. Never been updated with nearly everything else having been. Originally sculpted by a man named Michael Perry. Michael finished this sculpt in the hospital. He had one arm. His off-hand arm. He'd lost his favoured hand in a battle reenactment accident. This was 27 years ago, in 1996, and it still holds up to all the computer sculpted stuff that everyone uses now for highest fidelity of model crafting to date. And his offhand crafted model is the standard. What I think you'll find as ableist is your using of the concept of disabled fans as your crutch, shield, and sword. Assuming them incapable of functioning in the militant straw man fashion you assume we, the men of paints, demand. For fucking shame. Nobody's forcing. We're just encouraging. You're balking at it. And that's your problem, not theirs. You're right. It's not 40k. Citadel, the company that produces all of Games Workshop's minis, also produces one of the most well-known model paint lines, and in every GW store you'll only find Citadel paints and minis for sale. There are no Catalyst physical stores. You'll find Catalyst products in friendly local gaming stores which contain multiple brands, multiple products of all manner of paraphernalia including to encourage independent tournament circuits enforcing a painted army by default, as a pair of grey tides is harder to differentiate when they can be scrubbed up into each other in multiple close combat frays, they began enshrining victory points for their games within the rule set for painting their minis. The 40k fandom wailed and gnashed their teeth at this, as the new fandom was beginning to become vocal in the online circles, the same as I'm currently talking about right now. But it did make a sick sort of sense. Given that the minis in GW tournaments must be GW minis, why not make the players also shell out for a few tubs of paint on top of their usurious mini pricing? And then in contrast, Tops does not make paint. But also Battletech mechs are sold fully assembled in nearly all cases. Yeah, it's ready to play. I don't see any paint on them. The game doesn't require paint, but it does have an army painter starter kit. It does have a fully colored map sheets for sale and neoprene versions thereof also coloured. Alpha Strike has coloured cardboard for its markers and terrain. All the rule books are a plethora of coloured minis of all unit types as well as cursory guides on what to buy to paint your mechs. All Alpha Strike unit cards show coloured versions of the units, as do all 3D generated artworks within the books. The only time you'll see unpainted minis is a large convention showcase of incoming lines of production, showing off freshly finished 3D sculpts for the units awaiting production, or a Sasquatch rare mini in official guides. There is no need, but it is the standard. Duncan Rhodes, Mr. Too Thin Coats himself, has abandoned GW product paint guides. He now paints Battletech minis on his YouTube, just for the subscriber money and no catalyst salary. It's Battletech he paints now. It's not even only 40k that espouses painting your toys. People used to abuse Warmer Horde's rulebook page 8, win at all costs, by just looking at their opponent's model and accidentally dropping it, and as some of the paint chipped off, they'd declare to the judges that this was an unfinished model, and unfinished models can't be used. Good luck if it was your Warcaster. Battletech doesn't do that, but ITCs, independent tournament circuits, do ask that your mechs be painted before you bring them to game days. You want to do kitchen table forever? Then do whatever. You want to go in public? You want to go out and play with people? Make friends? Socialize in a safe environment and maybe win some prestige or actual awards amongst your peers? Then you're going to have to adhere to a standard beyond zero, just like with behavior and hygiene. I'm not going to paint your toys for you, no. If it came to it and you asked me politely in the FLGS, I might spare some primer next time we cross paths in the near future. Maybe let you paint with me, even use some paint colors you don't have, definitely giving pointers and advice. But no, I'm not painting your stuff for you. It's not lazy to refuse to do so either. That's not the gotcha you think it is. I've done mine, and it's not up to me to do them for you. If you pay me as a commission, then sure, that's what commissions are for. But if you do that and you get praise for your paint jobs, you'd better acknowledge the real painter. And if you're trying to build some fame for yourself within this IP, you might want to be known for your own work rather than that of someone else's. Nobody who asks this is doing anything other than trying to make a gotcha. If they say they do it for money and then they'd hate to do it for free, all you need to do to destroy that argument is ask how they got good enough to commission to begin with. 
because you can guess that it might have been the aforementioned bemoan time and effort. If it's so easy that they do it for commissions, then why not give themselves that quality of product? This cope angle is just outright disingenuous. It shouldn't be on others to facilitate your hobby for you. Yes, it does behoove friends into the same games to help each other to get better in all parts that they can. That's what friends are for, but the two are not the same. Doubly so if the one decrying your lack of willingness to do things for them does so in an adversarial manner. Why should I paint your mechs for you if you're insinuating or outright saying that I'm your enemy? Who's the paint Nazi now? Oh wait, apparently still me. And I'm being accosted by a paint Bolshevik. Get. Fucked. Look at the unpainted plastic. At a glance, grey and nondescript. Look at the coloured paper it plays on, or coloured terrain it plays in. Look at the painted plastic. At a glance, more connected to the game board. Nothing? It adds art. And this will need some context. Since time before record, we have seen proof that mankind has made art, cavemen paintings and such. All societies, in fact, as a tool used to gather, store and harness energy, have served the purpose of allowing our distant ancestors and contemporaries more free time from needing to concern themselves with Maslow's lowest two rungs on the hierarchy of needs. With grain stored and meat cured, with buckets of water from the well, we can now focus on how to build space to store both those resources and the eaters of those resources. Us. Architecture. Art. Now we have food and shelter of security, with weapons to stave off the possible interlopers. What do we do now? We think. We play. And it creates, in turn, art. More time free from survival means more time for the abstract and the esoteric. More time for play beyond the required minimum to build an elastic intellect in our offspring. And with this, it inspires. Art. With these comes more advanced solutions to everything. Comes more time to pursue the higher self. Which is inspired by art. Animals do not do this. If they have food, rest, mates, security, and young all taken care of, they do nothing. They wait for the needs to arise. The more intelligent ones play. But humanity is nearly unique in making art. We might see art in other species' workings, such as a spider's web or the patterns on a butterfly's wings, but they are purely functional. At most, we might see a bear stop to admire a sunset before going to effortlessly maul a foolish camper naturist for coming too close. We make art. Every civilization, even tribals living hand to mouth the world over, have figured out how to leave a handprint as a way to say they were here. We have a mind, not designed to end, in a body that was. The resultant existential dread is somewhat allayed, even unconsciously, even temporarily, by making works to defy our temporality. We desire to share, so that we be remembered beyond our existence, to live on. We create art to do this. Every layer of society's stratus, when given an opportunity, pursues more creative activities than the sham and drudgery of life. Even Patrick Beatman liked his music and studied the portfolios of his musician of choice. Art is the most human thing any of us can do, or appreciate at least. I know that the circles online that like to use the word based tend to overuse the term I'm about to. Much like everyone else overuses the word Nazi, but to say that painting your mechs, the artistic element of our fandom, the actual connection to the game, adds nothing to it? Buddy, you're a subhuman. And I mean that in the totality of the word. Refusing, nay, denigrating to artistically engage? That is beneath the human condition. You are literally, insofar as being a part of the Battletech's fandom, less than human. 
there is no redeeming you. If you ever make this argument, you are the cancer that is eating away at the modern tabletop world. You are worse than politicizing an IP for brownie points. You are worse than telling established player bases that they should leave hobbies because some newcomers don't like the culture surrounding something they saw a sanitized pastel rendition of in a poster. Worse than the corporate terror at the thought of losing a single potential dime of income so they flanderize their product to appeal to the broadest audience that will buy a product without asking why for a whole three minutes. You are all worse than all forms of hobby tourist. You are a hobby locust. Your kind swarm into hobbies and expect to have your egos fed without earning it. You consume the product before moving on to the next green field. Maybe you might say you've been into it for decades, but you've nothing but contempt for it and nothing to show for these decades. Do not pretend that you're actually in the hobby. You are in the consumerist globo homo hive mind. This is just the current thing you've looked at voraciously with the idea of collecting status amongst people you'll never meet or care about. At least the other main flavors of cope that I've talked about so far are ostensibly into the game, even if only barely. But you? You are not. You are not welcome here. Go back to your basement, you friendless, kissless Morlock. <clears throat> okay. I'm okay. This rift in the Battletech fandom can get quite vehement, as you've no doubt seen in my own example. And if I've scared you off, I doubt you're hearing this far anyway. Oh well, it's not really important that you listen to me, even not as far as I'm concerned. But for those who are still here, I feel like the newcomers might need some context for all this ranting and raving. So here it is. It started roughly for this purpose around the time of the clan invasion Kickstarter. There were a lot of rewards offered for pledging, and it was a stupendous success. People were buying, the pledge rewards were mounting, and everyone was having a great time. Except at the time, Catalyst Games. They were sweating bullets. You see, they couldn't manufacture the pieces they offered, not to the amount they offered it at. So they simply did not have enough production floor space in top facilities, nor did they have the time. So Catalyst did what Catalyst did best, a bad idea a PR debacle to even out the PR windfall that they had achieved. Eventually, the regular customer base would need to be able to buy the products. No matter the Kickstarter profit, lessening with every extra pledge reward they promised. Eventually, Catalyst would need to continue making money from regular customers. As such, they couldn't forsake their regular releases. But the pre-orders were so multitudinous that there was no way to fulfill every order in time. So they didn't. I myself went into my physical gaming store and saw the Game of Armored Combat box and a box set of elementals. I ignored the elementals, but I bought the Game of Armored Combat. And I posted online after opening it about how good the contents were and how impressed I was with the quality of everything and how I look forward to finally having physical minis for my gameplay and how much I was looking forward to getting my nephews into the game. You can tell clearly that I am from Australia, but regional Australia at that. How quickly do you think we were getting anything sent to us in our stores from Catalyst Games? I was met in reply with such a furor of jilted pre-order customers that I didn't believe it was anything but a troll. But no, it was real. There were people posting screenshots of the emails showing that they had not yet gotten their pre-order and when they asked what had happened to it, they were told simply that they would have to wait. Receipts and ticket stubs waving in the air and on as far as the doom scroll can pan down. These customers bemoaning that I, over a year late, was getting a box they ordered two of to get to before me. That part struck me as comical. I and the other pariahs, like me, were equally culpable as Catalyst Games themselves, because the plebeians should have to wait for our stuff if the hobby Brahmin had to. Chakravata's wheel shall be held still until they can drink their dose of the Soma, it seems. And Catalyst eventually got wind of this sustained wailing tumult, and they released a statement to the effect of, We are sorry, we are making products as fast as we can and have begged tops to allow us more production room floor space. Rut row, raggy. The pre-orders at this stage were so overpromised that Battletech had to arrest the production of everything else tops makes, thus not only still having limitations for themselves, but now adding more to others. Eventually, it was done with, and hopefully Catalyst has learned their lesson with promising too much in the current Kickstarter. But I wouldn't hold your breath, boys. So, with other releases coming out between that, previous, and this current Kickstarter campaign, 
There were a few Barnes & Noble exclusive releases of famous mercenary companies having their own lances with mixtures of new variants of existing mechs, jumping versions of the mechs, reposes, and new machines to be found within. And this is where the diatribes start making sense, I promise. You see, there are those for whom a purchase is the entire hobby. People who have already got nine of each Funko Pop and whose greed was instrumental in the downfall of the previous big campaign. These exclusives were rumoured to be a limited run, uh, just like the Clan Buster Black Knight model, albeit far less so. And surely Barnes & Noble won't ask for a lot of them, so it's possible they'd run out, right? So maybe we shouldn't go too crazy and just get a reasonable amount of them, right? Right? Nope! Let's be one guy buying every single piece of their Battletech stock all at once, including both Game of Armor combat boxes they have. Wait, no, not all the products. Not the books, just the mechs. At my most charitable understanding, this could simply be the result of hobby trauma, with product availability insecurity at the forefront of one's mind. One might have a mild panic at the idea that some other neckbearded galoots coming in and snatching the box they really want the mech from the most, never being seen again outside of eBay charging 35 US dollars for its solo. Still a shitty move to buy all of the stock, isn't it though? And then a shitty move again to post all the boxes in their masses saying, Oh, I did a thing! Like it's something to be proud of, to be so selfish. Other pay pigs like them would reply in these communities with congratulations and hawks and flipper claps like the well-trained seals like they are seeing their fish. But a lot of others would also say that this is a shitty thing to do, to buy all the supply up like that. The rebuttal? Smells like poor in here. I mean, I could have 10 grand in cash to spend on pure frivolity, and if I only wanted Battletech, it'd make no difference now. You've taken the entire supply that I could walk in and buy. Well, they do have more coming in in about a week, but I can't resist, I'm gonna go buy that too. <laughs> What's the sentiment? A sentiment backed up with more photographic evidence. Box posting is the original worst. Showing off the intact box with the Barnes & Noble exclusive sticker as if that grants them prestige, like they want it. All they're doing is turning a gameplay piece into Stinky Pete from Toy Story 2. Never out of the box, meant to be played with, develops crazy psychosis about it. And then to never play with it, or to open it, only to keep a possibly limited item to add value and maybe eventually resell. That is not a hobby. And naturally myself and others of the nascent Breakaway Battletech community took issue with this. What was not expected was the fact that people who were proud of not painting their mechs would join the fight on the side of the box posters. You see, at least the anti-painterlists would appreciate the game, probably, and having the game be less available, more limited to the public at large thanks to a few pay pigs, one would think the idea that treating the actual game minis like a Funko Pop to buy and never play with for a product that has a lot of problems regarding distribution would be bad. But no, the titanium white supremacists were the enemy. The paint Nazis, as was the oft-flung term when paint snobs wasn't having enough of a scare-off effect. And this is whence come of the rift and arguments. Normally the fandom writ large would live and let live, but now the anti-paint crowd tends to passive-aggressively post on their communities, trying to find opposition like someone painting their mech's pride flag colours, daring anyone to reveal themselves to be part of the axis of evil that is the paint enthusiasts. The painters? They just paint and encourage each other. Myself and others like me are not discouraging. We are actually the people who interest the layman into the game. We've got a veritable cornucopia of games out there, a movable feast for the mind and eyes with any flavor of fandom ready to be consumed. What will make someone want to play a game more? Seeing paraphernalia on the shelves amongst everything else? Or seeing people really enjoying this one game in a place that, that you can access? Any game can have plain grey plastic and data dense sheets of paper on a shelf. The only thing that will stand out is the stuff that actually gets used and loved. And that's what we do. We love Battletech. We don't want the game to be festooned with people who consider a pre-order to be a writ of entitlement above all the other fans. We don't want a suggestion towards colours as an indictment of our character as to enjoying a tattoo of the famous Virgin Windmill. We want to have people who actually enjoy the full immersion of the hobby and game and IP of the fandom all together to be the ones who are considered the forefront of Battletech's cultural vanguard. Not those who actively sneer at the notion of some elements or who chase fame at the expense of anyone else around them. 
I, myself, am a middle tier painter, if that. It takes me forever to paint a mech to my satisfaction, but along the way I am enjoying every moment. I frequently pause to ease my aching back and marvel at the process I've made. I don't care that there are others better than me. Good. Let them inspire me and others towards improvement. It's not about oppressing the poor disheveled types who can't paint. If you can type your disagreement with me on this video, you can pick up a paintbrush. It's not punching down to merely suggest that there's a portion of the fandom that appears to actively delight in denigrating the very notion of painting, nor is it punching down to tell them that their attitude is the one in the wrong. If anything is punching down, it is the box posters acting as though they are some upper class of aristocrats nickering on about the pause and the slow to buy. The people whose defense the anti painterists leap to. And so with this, I've run out of things to say. The video has come to an end. This is not for anyone but my own satisfaction. And it's not at anyone. But if the shoe fits, then you're free to go ahead and wear it. It shouldn't be considered a problem to paint your mechs or to be expected that you paint your things that you love or enjoy. And you shouldn't treat it like a chore. It can feel like one, but like raising a child, it is both your burden and your satisfaction. Oh, and by the way, if you think there is any kind of debate actually to be had still about this, then feel free to circle a, a Dollar General parking lot on your map of choice, and I'm pretty sure there'll be someone willing to debate you about it.